Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome back to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for The Media Speaks. And friends, before I start with the uh, Fukushima and everything that's coming, I have a very important announcement that I did not want to have to make. I've been avoiding saying this, but now I'm going to say it. Google is specifically targeting this show, targeting my show. I cannot get on to Google Hangouts to do a live show on my computer, on any browser, including Chrome. I have the newest uh, update. I got the newest version of Windows you can possibly have. I have a virus killer. There are no viruses on here. Every other site works amazing. I cannot do it from any other computer if I use my account, which negates it being my computer as the problem, which was the joke that D. Lake and Kyle were saying. I was laughing about it for a while. I'm not laughing anymore, friends. So do me a favor, contact Google and ask them why I am no longer able to do live videos. Because guys, guess what? You're used to watching me at 4, 4.30 in the morning. You won't be anymore. Now you gotta wait for the high def to load onto my channel as well as uh, the media speaks because Google is targeting the correct views and I can no longer do a live hangout. So there aren't gonna be any more live shows. I can't do them because of Google targeting this show. Yes, I said it. It is not a computer problem. It is not a glitch. This is Google targeting this show. Friends, um, one of the things that Google has done via targeting this show is made it so that I could not do the massive Fukushima update this month because I was trying to deal with this. It's been something I've been dealing with for like a month. I've been talking about it on the Media Speaks quite often. And uh, so what I'm going to do is just trickle in the Fukushima story, uh, a couple of them today. And then in a few weeks, we'll do a massive Fukushima update, excuse me, for September. Jerusalem Post. I swear to God. Hamas. No, but they're just as good as the Jews. Hamas. We attempted to hit the nuclear reactor in Demona. I don't care who financed Hamas. You don't find the Israelis trying to bomb nuclear power plants in other countries, do you? Now, I do know that they're trying to stop the plant from opening in Iran, an earthquake zone where they shouldn't be building one, but they do not bomb existing nuclear power plants because you don't share their religion. That's only the Islam, the religion of peace, that does that. And again, I'm being facetious, but let's be real. Your average Islamist is not the problem. Your average Islamist is somebody who I'd like to meet and have a beer with. I'm talking about scum like this. I don't want to hear, you know, the U.S., and they gave Hamas money. Of course they gave Hamas money, because the U.S. is part of every crappy thing that goes on in the world. That does not justify this kind of behavior by these bastards. Three rockets were launched at Demona in southern Israel on Wednesday afternoon. The Iron Dome intercepted one rocket before it could land, while two other rockets landed in open areas. You know, because Hamas is too freaking stupid to realize that if they nuke Israel, everybody in the Gaza Strip is going to be having the kind of birth defects and cancers and heart disease problems and everything else that we see in Belarus, that we're seeing in Tokyo now. That is what Hamas wants to do to the area. That's what these wonderful freedom fighters want to do. Do you want to know why people blockade your ass? Because you act like animals. You should be blockaded. Demona is the location of Israel's nuclear reactor. There was no indication that rockets damaged any part of the reactor. Do I like the Israeli government? No. I like Hamas's government less. Hamas claimed responsibility for the rockets, stating that it had been attempting to hit the nuclear reactor because they're part of every evil thing on the earth. Militants from Hamas' Qasem Brigade said they had launched long-range M75 rockets toward the nuclear reactor in Demona. Oh, but it's the religion of peace! We need to lift the blockade on these animals! Minutes later, the Iron Dome intercepted rockets in Nestiziona, Yazni and Rehovit in central Israel as Gaza terrorists extended the range of their rockets on Operation Protective Edge's second day. 
Yeah, because nuking the Jews is going to help the Gazans. You see, they got this special kind of Islamic fallout that it only falls on Christians and Jews. It doesn't fall on Palestinians or Israelis. It avoids them by some magic. Earlier on Wednesday, two rockets fired from Gaza Strip were intercepted. Code, code red rocket alert sirens sounded in Halan and Bat Yam prior to the interceptions. No injuries or damage were reported on the attacks. The Islamic Jihad took responsibility for the rockets fired towards Tel Aviv. Why are they blockaded? Rocket alert sirens also sounded in Zikran Yaakov, some 120 kilometers north of the Gaza Strip on Wednesday. The IDF confirmed that two rockets fell in open areas of the H.O. Hof Harkarmel Regional Council south of Haifa. The attack marked the furthest north that rockets from Gaza had fallen. So don't give me this BS that if you somehow lift the blockade, that suddenly the Gazans are going to accept Israel's right to exist. It's BS! RT, Fukushima nuclear meltdown worse than initially reported, according to TEPCO. There's no surprise here. Anybody that has followed this Fukushima mess has known this was coming. It's just that I have been saying this since day one, and now that we're a few years removed from it, now they're coming out with it like it was some great epiphany. I'm sorry, we were right about it on this show three years ago. The meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant's third reactor building was even worse than initially believed that TEPCO has announced. What do you do? You don't invest in GE. You don't invest in TEPCO. You don't invest in anything that has nuclear power in it from anyone. In fact, the power company's new appraisal of the Fukushima number 3 reactor building shows that all, or nearly all, of the fuel rods contained inside were melted, dropping onto the floor of the containment vessel. If true, the news means that the power plant could be even tougher to decommission. And of course, this is what Hamas wants to bring down on the Middle East. According to the Japan Times, TEPCO first estimated back in November of 2011 that roughly 63% of the reactor's fuel rods had melted. But TEPCO now believes that after studying conditions surrounding the fuel core, the reactor's cooling system stopped functioning more than five minutes earlier than previously estimated. As a result, it says the meltdown would have started around the same time period. And again, if you're new to this topic, it matters for your cancers, for your heart diseases, for what's going to be going on all over the world. You can't eat food out of Pacific Ocean anymore. If you do, you're committing suicide. You can't live in Hawaii, the west coast of California, Oregon, or um, uh, Alaska, because and Washington, because if you do, you're committing suicide. Am I clear enough? I hope so. As reported by the Yamuri Shimbun, it is possible that with the more nuclear fuel resting in the containment vessel than originally estimated, removing it will require more careful planning. Of course, they have no plan now that takes less than 35 years. As the core meltdown is now believed to have started earlier than was previously thought, the amount of melted nuclear fuel that passed onto the containment vessel through into the containment vessel through the pressure vessel is considered to have been greater, making it technically more difficult to extract the melted fuel and dispose of it, the newspaper said. Which we've said here for how long? Three years. Thank you. Despite the new findings, however, TEPCO spokesman Sinichi Kawamura said the company is still hoping to find some fuel that had not melted down. Yeah, now it's just a hope. We think some fuel still remains at the core part based on the actual plant data, he said, as quoted by the Japan Times. The news comes as the effects of nuclear meltdown continue to be felt throughout the region, and if Hamas has its way through all the Middle East. In late July, a new report discovered that Japan's famous mask monkeys were testing positive for blood abnormalities that could potentially make them more susceptible to infectious diseases. Well, guess who's closely related to the Meku monkeys? Mankind! So the same things that happened to them with these infectious diseases will be happening to us. The tests were conducted on wild monkeys living in the Fukushima region, and the results of the blood exams were linked to the radioactive fallout at the power plant. Meanwhile, another July report by Japan's Agriculture Ministry found that 14 different rice paddies, all outside of the power plant's evacuation zone, which is what they say is safe, were in fact contaminated with radioactive material. As RT reported then, five others inside the evacuation zone were also contaminated, so don't be eating any rice unless you're sure that it did not come from the west coast of the United States, the Orient, 
or uh, you know Hawaii or something because if it did you're eating poison and again this is what Hamas wants to do they want to poison almost all of the Islamists what you mean Hamas would hurt Islamists thousands of Islamists will be hurt if Hamas creates a Fukushima that's fact it's not opinion Guys, I haven't, didn't get to do much of a uh, massive uh, Fukushima update. I also didn't get to do a news from the science front last week. Well, I guess the whole show was. It was an Ebola special on uh, the Media Speaks. Well, I do have your science update here for those of you that may have missed it. NASA, NASA announces Mars 2020 a rover payload to explore the red planet as never before. Again, I'm much more excited about finding out if there's bacteria in the clouds of Venus because the chemical makeup implies that it would. I'm more excited to see the moons of Saturn and Jupiter where we know water is, exists and very likely sea life. I'm not all that excited about the big dead red planet, but some people are, so here we go. The next rover NASA will send to Mars in 2020 will carry seven carefully selected instruments to conduct unprecedented science and exploration technology investigations on the Red Planet. NASA announced the selected Mars 2020 rover instruments Thursday at the agency's headquarters in Washington. Managers made the selections out of 58 proposals received in January from researchers and engineers worldwide. Proposals received were twice the usual number submitted for instrument competitions in the past. This is an indicator of the extraordinary interest. Um, it's going to cost about $130 million for the development of these instruments. But, I mean, just a real quick, I can't even go over all these or I'll be here all day. So I'm just going to pick some of what's on this. Again, InfoWars has it posted as well. NSA announces Mars 2020 rover. Look it up, you'll find it. Uh, in a nutshell, um, Matt's KMZ, an advanced camera system with panoramic and stereoscopic imaging capability with the ability to zoom. It will also determine mineralogy, that's what kind of rocks are there, on the Martian surface and assist with rover operations. We've got uh, the SuperCam, it's an instrument that can provide imaging, chemical composition, and mineralogy. It's kind of redundant there. Scanning habitable environments with Raymond and luminescence of organics and chemicals. A spectrometer will provide fine scale imaging and uses of ultraviolet laser to determine fine scale mineralogy. And they've all, what's oh, one more here we got? The Mars Oxygen Experiment, an exploration technology investigation that will produce oxygen from Martian atmospheric carbon dioxide. In other words, uh, one more step towards us being able to stay there and study the planet. You know what? That's something I am in favor of. I just wish we would focus on where the life was very likely at now as opposed to where the life may have been in the past. It says NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will build and manage the operations of the Mars 2020 rover for the NASA Science Mission Dictoriat at the agency's headquarters in Washington. Friends, you are listening to The Correct Views. You can donate by going to thecorrectviews at hotmail.com. Every penny you give me goes to a better show. You can find my books. Um, I have a horror story called Asleep Unknowing. I have a historical piece called Risen about the resurrection of Christ, and it proves it without using the Bible to do so, and a Tales from the Crypt kind of short horror story for 99 cents. Amazon Kindle, it's called The Lucky Leprechaun. Go pick it up, it's a good read. Um, guys, I also want to ask you, if you can, to check out the Seacrest Motel if you are in Sandusky, if you're going to Cedar Point, if you're going to any of the events that are in Sandusky, why are you going to spend between $80, $150, $200, $300 for a hotel room? You can get that price beaten at the Seacrest Motel. You've never had a more comfy bed, never had a better room. It's everything you need for much, much cheaper than you're going to find anywhere else. All you got to do to get these rates is to say that you heard about it. Tell Vicky at the Seacrest Motel that you heard about the Seacrest Motel from TCV, The Correct Views. All right, guys, a few more stories to get to. Um, Yazidis tormented by fears of women and girls kidnapped by ISIS jihadis. Again, and I've said this over and over again, and I'm going to keep saying it. Most people's problem with Islam is not that they hate Islamists. They hate the kind of people that tend to get into areas of control in Islam, the same way that a lot of people do not hate Americans. They don't hate me. They don't hate you. They hate America because of the people that tend to get in charge of America. They are the scummiest, worst Obama, Bush, Clinton people you've ever seen. That is the same reason 
that many of us are tired of Islam. We're tired of it. And this is why. For the past week, Kandahar Kilip's hands were trembling whenever his phone has rung. And again, he's Islamic, and I'm on his side, so I'm not anti-Islam. The man is Islamic, or at least he's an Arab. You know what I mean. I'm not against Islam or Arabs. He nervously greeted his daughter, who had been kidnapped when the Islamic State overran the Yazidi city in Sinjar. There was a minute of silence before he broke down sobbing. She said she is going to be sold as a slave this afternoon for $10, Kelly said, his tears dropping into the brown dust. What can a father say to that? How can I help? We feel so useless. Kelly's daughter, who he did not want to name, had access to a group phone passed between other girls imprisoned by the Islamic State in Bordash prison in central Mosul. All face the imminent prospect of being married off. Of course, being used by the jihadis as a sex slave is even worse. But they, they, they love Allah. They love Allah so much that they're going to rape a little girl. That's loving Allah. The world needs to know that that is where our women are, where they are being enslaved young and old alike, he said, sitting in the dirt outside a building site near the Iraqi Kurdish city of Duhuk, that he and some 70 other Yazidis are now using a shelter. Dalnuk and the strip of land to the fish, fish harbor crossing into Syria are now teeming with Yazidis who have escaped in the past 48 hours from Mount Sinjar in northern Iraq, where they had been besieged by ISIS. Nearly all of the Yazidis the Guardian met offered stories of women and girls being kidnapped or of men being killed in brutal rampages that has shattered centuries of coexistence in Iraq's northwest. Keep in mind that these people have been in this area longer than the Islamists. This is a historical fact. It is not my opinion. So don't say that well, we could share the land with the Islamist fascists. This is what happens when you share land with evil people. Again, this isn't a few Islamists. It said that all the people they talk to have been experiencing this. We didn't know what hit us, the man said, who joined the conversation. We were asleep one minute and running for our lives the next. Some Yazidi men say that they had phoned their daughter or wife's phone number only to be told tersely by strange male voices not to call again. It's more than our heritage, said Wadawa Jawla, another father squatting helplessly in the soil. It's our heart and soul. My daughter means more to me than anything. She is not in Borish, Bordash prison, but we are sure that she is in Tel Afar, which is a nearby town. Of all the minorities ousted by the ISIS advance, the Yazidis continue to pay the biggest price. Their self-contained existence on the Nineveh Plains, where they had long been in the crosshairs of the scum jihadis, has been shattered in a bloodlust that has also sent the area's Christians who were there longer than the Islamist swines, and I don't mean the Islamist people, they're great people, I mean the Islamist swines who are not great people, let me be clear. Shabak Shias and Turkmen fleeing to Erbil. A large number of those who fled Sinjar climbed the nearby mountain range where they remained trapped. So basically, these wonderful ISIS people, who much like Hamas just want to get along with their neighbors, are busy butchering, slaughtering, and raping, just like Hamas. Um, guys, a little, uh, a little bit of good news for you, the Washington Compost here. Since marijuana legalization, highway fatalities in Colorado are at historic lows. Oh, but people are going to be driving stoned and there's going to be more accidents and we can live in peace with Hamas. Uh, since Colorado voters legalized pot in 2012, prohibition supporters have warned that recreational marijuana will lead to a scourge of drugged drivers on the state's roads. They often point out that when the state legalized marijuana in 2001, there was a surge in drivers founder of Smoke Pot. They also point to studies showing that in other states that have legalized pot for medical purposes, we've seen an increase in the number of drivers testing positive for the drug who were involved in fatal car accidents. 
The anti-pop group Sam, um, they took my name for nefarious purposes, recently pointed out that even before the first legal pot store opened in Washington State, the number of drivers in that state testing positive for pot jumped by a third. The problem with these criticisms is that we can only test for the presence of marijuana metabolites, not for inebriation. Metabolites can linger in the body for days after the drug's effects wear off. In other words, they're not stoned, sometimes for weeks. Because we all metabolize drugs differently and at different times and under different conditions, all that a positive test shows us is that the driver had smoked pot at some point in the last couple of weeks. Let us remember that they also do this with alcohol. They give you the lie. Oh, our alcohol is present in the bloodstream of X a number of people that have been in an accident. What they don't tell you is the driver was not impaired in the least, and he would have had the same accident under the same circumstances even if he had not had a drink. Am I saying that alcohol played no part in it? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Am I saying that they used the presence of alcohol to steal money from you? Yes, that is also what I'm saying. I hope I can make myself very clear. It makes no sense that loosening restrictions on pot would result in a higher percentage of drivers involved in fatal traffic accidents having smoked the drug at some point over the last days or weeks. You'd also expect to find that a higher percentage of churchgoers, good Samaritans, and soup kitchen volunteers would have pot in their systems. You'd expect a similar result among any large sampling of people. This doesn't necessarily mean that marijuana caused or was even a contributing factor to accidents, traffic violations, or fatalities. This isn't an argument that pot wasn't a factor in at least some of those accidents either, but that's precisely the point. A post-accident test for marijuana metabolites does not tell us much at all about whether pot contributed to the accident. Since the new Colorado law took effect in January, the drug driver panic has only intensified. I've already written about one dubious example, he writes, in which the Colorado Highway Patrol and some local or national media perpetuated a story that a driver was high on pot when he slammed into a couple of police cars parked on the interstate exit ramp. While the driver did have some part in his system, his alcohol level was off the charts, which I'm not in favor of, and was more likely the cause of the accident. Um, we are going to see... And get the, it's, it's, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I'm excited. It seems to me the best way to gauge the effect legalization has had on the roadways is to look at what has happened on the road since legalization took effect. Here's a month-by-month -month comparison, and if you go to the chart, it fell like a rock. As you can see, road raid, roadway fatalities this year are down from last year and down from a 13-year average. Since the pot's been legal, accidents of all kinds have been down by 13%. Of the seven months so far this year, five months saw a lower fatality figure than last year, two months saw a slightly higher figure this year, and in one month, the two figures were equal. If you add up the total fatalities from January through July, it looks like this. Down, 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 down. Go look at the graphs, guys. But I have to tell you, the facts are here. Marijuana has not increased the accident or fatality rate. As a matter of fact, it has gone down since then. That is a correct view. Friends of FresnoB.com. I'm going to give you two dumdies today, by the way. you got two, two dumdies. Two, uh, for those of you that don't know, look up Dunce Cap of the Month. I just posted one a couple of days ago. I mail Dunce Caps to people. I mail them all over the place. I've mailed them to the FBI. I've mailed them to the uh, various institutions, police departments, you name it, schools. Whoever does the dumbest thing in any given month gets the Dunce Cap of the Month award. I end up with too many dummies to get to them all in one show, and when I get backed up, I do more than one like I am now. This is dummy number one. Southwest Fresno leaders criticize hiring of white teacher for Gatson School's cultural studies. In other words, a black person can teach American history, which was largely white. That's fine, and I think it should be. But if you are a white person, teaching about black history, then you're just the stupid honky and you'll never be able to do it. That's what they're saying. White, blacks, blacks can learn white culture, but whites are just too stupid to learn black culture. And I'm sick of this. I am sick of this race baiting BS. With just weeks before the new Rutherford B. Gadsden Middle School opening in Southwest Fresno, 
community and church leaders giving churches a bad name are calling on Fresno Unified School District to reconsider its hiring of a white teacher to instruct African American, Latino, and Southwest Asian studies there. So let me guess, we should take the black teachers away from anything that teaches white history. I think it's a bad idea, but that's what your, these church leaders are in favor of. I mean, you gotta follow their own logic. At an early morning news conference Monday, a small group of concerned citizens led by Reverend Karen Crozier, whose scum met in front of the school on Church Avenue and Martin Luther King Boulevard. People at the gathering said the new school, which is the first in Southwest Fresno Middle School in decades, needs teachers who reflect the ethnic and racial background of its students. In other words, they want all white teachers in expensive districts, right? They don't want black teachers teaching in rich districts, in white districts, right? Does that sound racist to you? It sounds racist to me too, but that's what they're preaching. I'm just, I'm just teaching it to you. I'm not saying I'm in favor of it. That's why they're getting the dumbity of the day. Crozy and others were dismayed to learn a person hired to teach the school three cultural study classes were white because white people are stupid. District officials initially considering hiring a teacher of color, she said, but ultimately hired Peter Beck. Why? Because he was the best teacher. But no, they think that you can't do that if you're white because only black people are able to jump color lines. White people, we're all haters. We're all ready to lynch somebody, right? Dumb D of the day. Why do I do these? So you can contact them. So you can call them Miss Karen and her church and let her know how wrong she is. That's why I do these. Friends, uh, last dumb D of the day on InfoWars. Six years, $1.7 billion later, the DHS visa system is deemed a failure. $1.7 billion of your tax money just went whoosh for something that doesn't work. While stories abound of government wasting our tax dollars, here is one that nevertheless sticks out. An automated a Homeland Security system that cost a mind-boggling $1.7 billion with a B and took nearly six years, that's more than half a decade for you Kesha fans, to develop has turned out to be a malfunctioning boondoggle. Unfortunately, it goes on, the government regularly fleeces American taxpayers in this manner. The failed system was supposed to speed up the way immigration forms a process, but instead, it takes twice as long with the multi-billion dollar state-of-the-art flop. You can't make this stuff up. It's all documented in a scathing Department of Homeland Security Inspector General report, with a link here, that blasts the monstrous agency for, among other things, poor planning. No. Poor planning is you didn't put enough gas in your car before you went on vacation, so you needed to put some more gas in. A, uh, a, a bad planning, poor planning, is not $1.7 billion. The failed experiment known as the Electronic Immigration System was launched in 2013 with a $536,000 contract that ballooned up to $1.7 billion and doesn't work. Instead, the costly new system drastically slows the process down despite the astounding $1.7 billion price tag. It requires federal workers to dedicate twice as much time to each application than when they, when they did it in the paper form. So how are they going to fix it? They're going to spend $58 million more dollars! Oh my God, that's the dumb of the day. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Contact DHS. Let them know they're the stupidest asses you've ever heard of. And if you would like to donate to the show, friends, you can do so at The Correct Views at Hotmail.com. Also, go to TheMediaSpeaks.com and look up the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. And let Google Hangout know that you do know they are screwing over The Correct Views. I've put it out there. I need you guys to alert them. Good night, friends. God bless.